Is this the dagger? Oh! Illegal substitution. Too many men on the field. Saskatchewan. Gizmo has a block in the sideline. He has not stepped out. He may go all the way. He needs one block and he'll do it easily. Promise mess I wouldn't do this. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores! Hey, 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 it's the Outsiders, powered by the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City. It's podcast 86 in season number three. I'm Bryn Griffiths. He's Robin Brownlee. Look who's with us today. It's Tony Brar from Oilers Television. How you doing today? Bryn, Robin, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing fantastic. It's my favorite day of the week. It's a Monday. It's time to get things rolling. Can't wait to get started. Look at this. Young guy, good-looking young guy with some hair. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this, this is uh, this is sort of like a change up after the fastball week after week. Isn't it? <laughs> hey, hey, Robin, I appreciate the uh, the compliments that I told you to say. So I'll slip you that twenty dollars after. Nice, right? just there in time go. for the festive season. Tony, <laughs> before we get started and talk about anything Oilers or National Hockey League or Olympics or whatever, got to talk about you because there's still a lot of people who see you. But are wondering, okay, so where did Tony come from? How did he get started? How do you want to jump in on that one? I mean, uh, I think it all starts with my parents. I, I know it's probably such a cheesy answer, but uh, my parents are everything to me. Uh, the reason why I do what I do every single day is because of my parents. My parents, uh, both Nermal and Darshan Brar, they came into Canada in 1981 for one reason and one reason only, and that's to give their kids and future family at the time an opportunity to find happiness. Uh, obviously they're from India, third world country. There weren't a lot of opportunities back there. So every day I wake up and I just kind of hope to fulfill that purpose that they kind of set out for me. So that's really where the foundation starts. There's a, a whole a lot of different branches for sure, but that's, that's where the foundation starts is with my parents. I even have their uh, birth years tattooed on my arm just to remind myself every day and whenever I need to pick me up, we've all been there before. Of course, mental health has come to, uh, come to light over the fa- last five to 10 years. And, and now that we're aware of it and we're able to battle through that, sometimes you need a little pick me up and that's, that's my pick me up right there. You know, Tony, it's interesting. Um, younger people today, to me at least, are are so much more aware, and maybe they need to be so much more aware of what they want to do and where they want to go, whether it's in the last years of high school and so on and so forth. Uh, I had no clue. I mean, you graduate from high school and you're going to go to university and it's like, well, I'll take something, but I'm not quite sure what you also had some different routes to go. If I, if I, read correctly did you not go after grad and go to college and take some business before you figured out you wanted to be a hockey guy i did absolutely robin so here's a little bit of a premise here when i was 18 i was much like a lot of different 18 year olds i had no idea what i wanted to do uh now when i was a kid I always wanted to be growing up a weatherman. I wanted to be a meteorologist (laughs) and cover the weather because I know this is super nerdy, but I used to come home and watch the weather report all the time because the person I I can never remember his name, but the person was so fun to watch. And I'm like, I want to be that guy. Like he looks so happy. He looks like he's able to show off his personality. And then I grew up, I, I, fascination for sports just continued to grow. I always grew up watching hockey with my dad and I wanted to be a sports broadcaster, but somewhere along the way, especially during high school, I kind of talked myself out of that dream. I, I call it mental immaturity. That's just the term that I used and I coined for myself, but I just kind of didn't believe in myself. I didn't think it was a realistic possibility. I talked myself out of going on a safe route, finding a business job. And for the first couple of years, while I was still kind of figuring and massaging that part of my life out, I went to U of A. I took two years of science courses, but also some business courses on the side. And I figured, okay, this is what I want to do. So I transferred over to Nate and then I got my business degree. And then I'll always remember this one date in my life and the exact time of it as well. November 2nd, 2016, 9.17 p.m. 
I made the decision to chase my childhood dream and that is to work in TV broadcasting. And truthfully, it's, it's been the best decision of my life. Well, there's a real common thread here because a friend of ours, Hunter Ryan Singh, who grew up in Wetaskiwin, as he always yeah. reminds us, kind of went through the same thing where he said, I was just playing street hockey and this was kind of my dream and I just followed it. And, and I love the fact that he followed it and has been so successful as he's been and continues to be. But in your situation, you must have been like a street hockey player because you got these trophies behind you and nobody knows what the hell that even is. Explain exactly uh, your your fascination, like when you got going with hockey and what you've done to earn these trophies. Yeah, just like every other Canadian, I grew up playing on the streets until uh, until dusk and until my mom was yelling from my from the front door saying, come inside, dinner's already ready for an hour and it's already cold. But, um, you know, my brother and I, we, we always pushed each other growing up uh, on the street. And then we also played a lot of ball hockey uh, ever since our mid-teenage years. Uh, you know, obviously, hockey is a very expensive sport. So the first year I played ice hockey was actually 15 years old. My, my dad still to this day will apologize to me saying, I'm so sorry I didn't get you into ice hockey sooner. I'm like, Dad, you have nothing to sweat about. Thank you for the three years I was able to play ice hockey. And that kind of evolved into if you want to call it a ball hockey career, because I was able to kind of stem my fundamentals from ice hockey and transfer it into ball hockey where I was able to thrive a little bit on the local scene. I got recognized on the provincial scene, then the national scene, and then ultimately the world scene. And uh, I shamelessly put my trophies out here just to kind of boost the self-confidence a little bit whenever you need to. But uh, you, sometimes you got to remind yourself that, uh, you know, you're capable of doing some pretty good things. Yeah. yeah you know, Tony, um, I see somebody like you and I know, thank, thank God, finally, uh, people are realizing that uh, hockey needs to be and should be for everybody, whether it's yeah. talking about it or playing it. Um, if you're, if you're saying, no, you're not, it's not for you. And no, it's not for you. It's just for us. It's going to yeah. die. Yeah, um, I, I go back far enough. Um, I relate to somebody like you getting into the broadcasting and loving the game just because you love the game. Yeah. When I was a young reporter, and we know that's a long time ago. Uh, Biblical I would, times. I would sit and talk with uh, Robin Bawa. Okay. Yeah. Who, who, I mean, he was the, he, he was the groundbreaker and the difference yeah. maker. And I look at the stuff, I'll just use that word. He had to put up with even from his teammates, if you can believe it yeah. to, to just play hockey yeah. and then to make it through junior and to play in the national hockey league uh, as uh, you know, it's different now and it's easier now, but how does that apply to you? What, did you always feel like I can try and play even though you got in late? And then after that, did you think, yeah, there's no reason why I can't be a, a writer and a commentator in hockey. Had it got to that point yet for you or were there roadblocks that you ran into along the way? You know what, Robin, for me personally, I never felt that way. And that's just me sharing my experience. I didn't feel like I felt any obstacles uh, I've always had such a great support system around me. I've had uh, so many friends of so many different backgrounds and, and it was always a diverse community for me. I always lived in a diverse neighborhood growing up. Uh, for me, I felt like my options were limitless. Again, it was just more self-imposed at that point than anything else. So, But I've heard the stories of, of guys like Harnan Ryan Singh who had to deal with racism. You know, He has a great book. I'm not sure if I have the book behind me right now. It's actually up, uh, upstairs in my room, but uh, great you know, read. One game at, it's a great read. One yeah. game at a time. And he had to deal with so much racism. And then another person that comes to mind is a good friend of mine. Although we shared the same last name, we're not necessarily related, but now we call each other brothers and that's Dampy Brar. You know, he's a winner of the Willie O'Ree mm -hmm. community award, the inaugural one that was uh, a couple of years ago. He yeah. grew up playing professional hockey in the West Coast Hockey League for the Tacoma Sabercats. That was one of his stops. And he had to deal with a fair share, share bit of racism. And just because I didn't experience it doesn't mean that the game didn't need to, to grow and still needs to grow at this point. But I feel like 
the NHL, the NHLPA, uh, even just hockey fans in general are becoming more inclusive, and that's and that's all you can ask for right now. Sometimes you may not where may not be where you want to be right away, but good things take time, and good things will forever to take time because it it, it takes time to make sure that everything is. Uh, right and everyone is on the same page and I feel like we're really moving into that direction in a big way here it's a great segue into your career so I'm watching and you're you're coming up through the ranks and that kind of stuff then all of a sudden you get a hockey night in Canada gig one night because (laughs) because you know what Uh, I uh, Gene Principe who we love and we've known for decades and uh, I can't say enough great positive stuff about Gino but no. uh, obviously, Gino has had a rough couple of years personally. A lot of, you know, he's lost both of his parents and that kind of thing. But this door opens up for you and yeah. through circumstance. And you step through that door and you're doing a Hockey Night in Canada broadcast. That must have yeah. been absolute. I mean, I can't even imagine. I, I've had a long career. I've never had an opportunity like that. But you just took it on and you flourished with it. It must have been something special. You know, it was incredibly special. I mean, again, just coming back from from a time in my life where there was a lot of self doubt and uh, a lot of self confidence, where it was really in question. And then kind of, again, making that decision on November 2nd, 2016, 9, 17 PM. And all of that leading up to that one moment, you know, uh, the lights turn on, you're kind of rehearsing 20 minutes before you're about to talk to Ron McLean on the air. Ron McLean is so big in my household. I, I can't even explain to you how much my dad loves Ron McLean. And then the cherry on top for me, Bryn, there was right after I I completed my first hit of the night for Hockey Night in Canada. I'll remember forever. I was wearing my red suit, my black tie, white shirt. I'm a very visual person. That's how I remember things. And as soon as I finished, I could hear my earpiece, Ron McLean saying, thank you, Tony. Your parents, Nermal and Darshan, must be very proud. And I, I... kid you not, I almost shed a tear. I I was so close to shedding a tear on camera because I already talked about my parents and how much they mean to me. And, and that was the realization that, okay, we're, we're onto something here. But that is so Ron, if you know him a little bit. (laughs) Ron is the the ultimate professional. I've never met a uh, more of a professional, of course, outside of you two, uh, than Ron McLean. So, (laughs) Red, a red suit, eh? Holy. Yeah. Oh, well, we couldn't pull that off. You could. We <laughs> you just couldn't. I was, I was feeling kind of ballsy. I was just like, you know what? Let's go for it. Why not? Now, did you, strange question in a way. Um, yeah. But it's a cliche. Uh, and we well. do strange questions here. So, well, no, I'm just, <laughs> in your circumstances, Tony, um, did you grow up looking up to anybody? Because your decision to become a broadcaster didn't come until later. But when you did go down that road, did you think, I've always thought this guy's pretty good. I like this guy's style. Because you don't. it's not stealing, it's borrowing. You look at somebody and go, I think that guy does a real good call. I want to be a little bit like that. What, anybody like that for you? Uh, you know what? I, I got to go with uh, James Duffy. He's probably my favorite broadcaster and host uh james duthie and i've heard nothing but great things about james duthie as well so he's obviously one ron mclean we grew up watching all the time you know my fondest memories of hockey despite going to every nhl game now which is an absolute honor and a privilege to do i'm very grateful for that my favorite hockey memories is when i was five years old every single night my dad was home so my dad worked in the oil fields and he worked on rotation shifts so he would be back once every three or four weeks. My favorite hockey memories is sitting in my dad's lap and watching initially the Leafs game because they're always on at 5 p.m. Mountain and then the Oilers game or whatever game was on after that. And that was my favorite memory. And every single night we watched Ron McLean. So James Duthie, Ron McLean, Bob McKenzie, uh, Darren Drager, these are all guys that I grew up idolizing and watching. And and you obviously try to borrow, just like a brand was making the motion, you try yeah. to borrow from, from each person and you try to massage it into your own style. So, you know, there's a great quote that I kind of live by. If you, if you're, if you refuse to live today, you, uh, sorry, if you refuse to learn today, you refuse to live today. So, uh, you always want to be learning every single day. It's funny you should say that because obviously, uh, Brian Williams stepped away after a 50 year yeah. broadcast career this past weekend Incredible. at the gray cup game. And as I was watching the, uh, 
you know, the career retrospect, all it just told me was that you can be more than just a broadcaster. You can be the, the, the voice of the consciousness of of the nation. And uh, Brian took that on with such flair, but it's uh, you're right. When you're trying to develop as a broadcaster, you find those little things. I don't call it stealing. I call it researching and making sure that you take the most positive stuff out of, out of everybody that you get a chance to watch or listen to. Of course. Okay, let's talk about this uh, stepping into the Oilers TV thing. How did that come yeah. about, and how is it going? First of all, it's fantastic. I mean, it is amazing. The best part about my job are my teammates. Uh, you know, because we spend so much time during the hockey season at the rink, that is the most important thing, and I'm so grateful to be surrounded by such great, talented, positive impactful individuals that I can call my friends every day. So that's first and foremost, I want to get that out of the way. They are the number one reason why my job is awesome. Uh, but it's been a, a great journey. Uh, again, I'm, I'm learning every day. I feel like, I feel like truthfully I've been, I've been able to kind of put out better content each and every year. I feel like I've been able to kind of ride that momentum a little bit. And just because I'm always willing to learn and how it came to be, I actually, started my Oilers TV career, uh, August 20th, 2018. I actually graduated officially from Nate August 18th, 2018. So it was two days after I graduated, I got super lucky. So I was out in Thunder Bay doing my practicum. I actually initially asked my teachers and my professors if I can take a full-time job in Thunder Bay as my practicum. Cause truthfully, I didn't want to settle for an internship. Right. Yeah, one thing that, one thing that people need to know about me is I'm highly competitive. Like if, if you give me this bar, I'm going to try getting to the bar up here. That's just kind of how I'm uh, hardwired. Thanks to my parents. Cause they're the hardest working, working people I know. But so I was working out in Thunder Bay. I was expecting to be there in two, three years. And then an opportunity opened up with the Oilers. I was actually initially on the events team like throwing t-shirts in crowds uh, the year before that. And I was able to kind of garner a little bit of a hardworking reputation, give this kid a break reputation. And they kind of threw me in for an interview and seven interviews later, I was able to impress enough and, and get the job two days after I graduated, which was incredible, incredibly lucky for sure. But I'm also a big believer that you create your own luck. So, you know, you know, Tony, it is there, there's some luck there, but a lot of it goes, with what you're saying to, to get in at your age and say, I'm at the rink all the time. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You are ahead of the game, my friend, because <laughs> I remember when I, and, and, and probably the same for Bryn, you know, you work your way up. I, I was, you know, in the Western hockey league back in 82 at the journal in 89. And, and you, and you look back and you go, yeah, I'm in the rink all day. I yep. go there twice a day. I'm there for yep. on game days, six, seven hours. Uh, then you're writing uh, yep. as a writer, a broadcaster, different thing, cut and tape back in the day. Yeah. But I wasn't 20 something. I, by the time I got worked my way up to have that so early, I tell you what, cause there'll be a time when you won't be in the rink every day. I'm not in the rink anymore. I miss it. Time moves on. Young guys come in. Um, you're ahead of the game, my friend, if you're, if you, but if, because you know what? It's not a real job. Working hard at what we do is a great gig. Real jobs yeah. are going to the factory at five in yeah. the morning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just like my dad did every day. And just like every frontline worker did throughout this pandemic, that is a real job. And like that it, hats off to everybody uh, who was on the front line throughout the pandemic doing their thing. Just want to give a quick shout out to them. But yep. like you said, it's not, it's, it doesn't feel like work when you love what you do. And I've been on the other side of the spectrum. So I feel like in life, life gave me the opportunity to learn what isn't for me and what is for me. Yep. And I think that is so important. And that's why I'm able to go to work every day with a smile on my face and, and, and have the opportunity to talk to great people like you guys and learn from you guys as well. So life's just amazing. I got to, this is kind of a twofold question. I'll ask the first one really quickly. Do you remember where you were in 2006 watching that order run to the Stanley cup final? Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. Which game? <laughs> oh, okay, we're going to get, and I, I, I'm pretty sure you actually know the exact time 
that you watch those games too because you take uh, you're taking note of everything. Well, let's just say <laughs> let's say Game Seven of the Stanley Cup Final because that was a crusher for a lot of people here. However, yeah. got to watch uh, a great run by a team that was good and had been put together by Kevin Lowe down the stretch. But uh, it, it's a setup question to the second one. But do you remember where you were when you watched that run? Yeah, Game Seven. I was actually at the viewing party in Old Rexall Place. Wow. While- Watching with my brother and my sister, uh, the three of us went down to the rink, and of course, it was a it was a soul crusher for the city of Edmonton. Oh yeah, a magical run to say the last. Okay, so that sets up the second question. So you saw the success that the franchise was having. Now we've gone through this little dark period, and yeah. then Connor McDavid appears on the scene, and it's been fun to watch. But it ha- they've got to take the next step, as you keep talking about. Now we're watching the team kind of struggle a little bit after getting off to a great start and the pressure starting to build here a little bit, but because you've seen the good times and you've seen the bad times, how are you viewing all of this? Like what we've been watching this year, it's been, to me, it's all part of the process of building a team and getting to that. Nobody climbs Mount Everest going straight up. You got to do the zigzag. And, and I guess we're kind of seeing that here. Are we not? Yeah, we are definitely seeing that. And listen, a little resistance for a hockey club is sometimes a good thing in the bigger picture. Take a look at the Tampa Bay Lightning a couple of years ago when they won the Stanley Cup. They lost four straight games once and three straight games once. Yep. And the mentality in that dressing room was, okay, the sky's not falling. Like, this is going to happen. Like, I, I vividly remember Steven Stamkos, Victor Hedman coming out after post-game of Vails, and you can still feel that confidence. Like, yeah, yeah, we're going through a rough stretch, but we know what we're capable of. And I feel like because I know the word young, uh, it doesn't really apply to Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisler because now they're in their primes, but still a relatively young core when you compare it to Stanley Cup champions of years past. And I feel like this is a time of resistance that is going to help massage and grow this Oilers team. And I feel like it's, in hindsight, it's going to be great, but in the moment, obviously – we live in the city of Edmonton. You guys know the fabric of this community and how much pressure is on this hockey team to perform each and every night, especially when they get off to the start that they did. So in the long term, I think it's going to be a good thing. Just look at teams like Tampa Bay Lightning in the past. Even the Colorado Avalanche a couple of seasons ago went through a five-game stretch where they dropped five straight. So. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Exactly. Exactly that. Well, and the truth about Edmonton uh, – And Montreal, for that matter. And I guess Toronto. I don't get the... We got this complex when it comes to Toronto. Never want to say anything good about them. But people are... It's never too soon to overreact in any of these cities. And that shows... (laughs) That shows that people... Because, hey, nothing worse... There's nothing worse than a shoulder shrug, than indifference. We don't care. So while fans here get off on a tangent good and bad oh we're nine and one we're winning the cup for sure and now yeah. five in a row oh man we got to start firing people and trading people yeah. um this is a city that cares about hockey that's the kind of city you want to work in no exactly the city that you want to work in i'll be honest with you sometimes i go on twitter and sometimes i learn off uh, off oiler fans because they're so knowledgeable here it's such a great fan base here and they care for their hockey team. What, what other thing can you ask for as an athlete, as a broadcaster, as anybody associated with the organization, whether you're a writer uh, covering the team, a, uh, a beat reporter, whatever the case is, then a fan base that is so invested in their hockey team that they'll take in what you say and they'll take in what you do in order to get the fact across about the hockey club. I think there's no better situation you could find yourself in you got to always keep an open mind, and you have to be able to change your always. opinion as a broadcaster if you want to be a good one. I, that's how I've always felt. Yeah. And a lot of great things come from fans. But conversely, you have something that they don't have. You have access. You can get a hold of yeah. people. Like, you could pick up the phone right now and call whoever you needed to call where fans don't have that. And is yeah. that something that's special for you now is that you have that ability, you, you're able to get in, in that door a little bit further than your average fan to find out more and, and develop a story? Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, it, I'm a very curious guy. So even if it's a stupid question, I'm not a believer in stupid questions, but we'll just coin that for, for, phrase right now. But 
even if it's a stupid question, I'll call, I'll call somebody and I'll be like, Hey, listen, what's going on here? This is my thought. And whatever the case is. And, and these people, the best part about it, they love talking hockey just as much as you do. So oh, they're yeah. going to pick up your phone and they're going to talk to you. They're going to, they're going to shoot the crap for five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever the case is. You get their opinion, you formulate your own opinion, but you also kind of uh, take other information. Like you said, Bryn, a, a good broadcaster is able to change their opinion. And I've been proven wrong so many times over my four years so far here at, uh, at Oilers TV, where I came in with a certain mindset after a conversation, I said, you know what? Maybe that person is right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny, Tony, too. And now it's a bit tougher now from where I sit to do what you do, because if people think you suck, they can tell you right away. There, there was when somebody wanted to say Brownlee, you suck. They had to write a letter to the editor. <laughs> there, there, there was no immediate. There was no yeah. immediate feedback. Let me ask you this: Everybody, whether you're writing or broadcasting, whether you're a rights holder or just an outlet that covers the team, you're a fan before you're a journalist or a broadcaster or a writer. How does that battle go when you finally become that journalist or broadcaster or writer? Because you want to be legit. You don't want to be, things are always great. The team's great. Everything's wonderful. Yeah. You got, yeah. If nobody's ever mad at you, you've got no credibility. Yeah, absolutely. Could not agree more. So growing up, of course, I grew up in Edmonton. I grew up cheering for the Oilers. But since I went into school in January of 2017, I, I kind of learned to put my fandom aside. And I, I consider I don't consider myself an Oilers fan. I consider myself a fan of the game of hockey. And hockey is filled with so many different storylines that I want to do my due diligence. It just happens to be the team I grew up watching now but I want to do my due diligence in getting the right story across. It's funny you should say that too, because I, I, I remember when the Los Angeles Kings won their first Stanley cup and yeah. we had Matt green, Jared Stahl, guys that, that we had watched very carefully here with the Edmonton Oilers. And it, all it did is it reconfirmed for me that I cheer for the guys in the jerseys as more than the Jersey. And yeah, I like to absolutely. see good guys win. At the end of the day, if you've got two yeah. teams that are in the Stanley Cup final and you know a couple of guys on that team, you cheer for that the, those guys to be successful. And uh, and I don't think that as a broadcaster there's anything wrong with that, but nope. objectivity no, no. is something that you've always got to maintain and you've got to try to see everything through glasses that allow you to see beyond, I guess, the polluted mind. And when I'm watching this Edmonton Oilers team right now, power play is starting to struggle, and you wonder why. And yet I've got some very good friends in the business, in the hockey business, who are scouts with teams in the Eastern team, in the Eastern Conference, who are giving yeah. me little tidbits on what I should be watching. And now I see it's ha starting to happen. But you, yeah. start to, you start to see the, the game a lot differently when you get a lot closer. Do you not find that? Definitely. You definitely do because – you're able to interpret cer certain things in the game a little differently because at the end of the day, you have more knowledge. Yeah. You have more knowledge. You're talking to more people. You know, there's a great quote uh, by, I think it's Matthew McConaughey. I know it's, I'll, I'll come back to it. I promise it's going to come full circle, but Matthew McConaughey says, uh, show me your five closest friends and I'll tell you what, what you're going to become. Or if you it's hang true. out with four fools, you'll become the fifth. The same thing applies here. You hang out with more hockey people, you become more knowledgeable in said subject. So you're able to analyze, you're able to look, you're able to view the game at such a completely different lens than you were able, even a year ago, two years ago, because facts have changed. And when facts change, your opinions change. And then you're looking out for certain things and you're looking out for uh, other things because your knowledge is just at a heightened sense. And, and you're right, Brent, like, after talking to all these people, you're able to look and pinpoint things that you were never able to look at before because you you had no pro you had no idea that that even existed or what exactly you were missing out on without the crazy emotion. See, that's the the thing, and and I miss yeah. the emotion watching sporting events. I love it when I get excited by stuff, but for the yeah. most part, watching the Oilers go through this little slump here. I'm not going to get as emotional as an average fan because I know that the wheel turns at some point and, and yeah. things just kind of play out the way, way they do. And I'm guessing that that's kind of how you start to develop as a broadcaster. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly how I feel. It, you throw away the fandom again, and you you. As soon as I finish after a loss, it's okay. What story do I tell tomorrow? Like it's almost just like the the result doesn't really dictate my mindset. My, my job is to be a broadcaster. It's to be a journalist. It's to get the story across. So as soon as I come home, win or lose, I'm thinking about tomorrow. Okay, what do I need to do to tomorrow? Because that is my job. You obviously got some good advice, maybe not specific to your career, but life advice from your, your parents. Yeah. Um, within the business though, uh, be it broadcaster or uh, print, I'm thinking when you guys, I mean, I, I've been long, long gone since you really came along working, but was there somebody along the way, be it a broadcaster, be it a print guy that either gave you some advice that has served you well, or you just watched how they went about their business and learned from it? Uh, two people really come to mind right away. Uh, one is uh, Kyle Bukoskis, who's the host of Hockey Night in Canada. Oh, yeah. And we connected while I was in school. Uh, I was probably just uh an ignorant kid on social media just dming him uh, and just say hey kyle like i'm a big fan of your work I, I love what you do you're one of my favorite broadcasters i'm just wondering if we can connect and you know just i, I the reason why i want to connect is and, and i tell pe- people this all the time because now i'm in kyle's position and i get a lot of people asking me the number one thing i say to those kids is when you reach out to someone and you reach out to a broadcaster the only reason you should be talking to them is to figure out their backstory and any tips. Don't ask them for a job. Don't ask them for a future opportunity because truthfully that doesn't really bode well with people uh, because they already have enough on their plate. So the reason why I talked to Kyle, I said, Kyle, I just want to know your backstory. And from your experience, I'll be able to learn. And when I learn, I'll be able to create opportunities for myself. So, I, I will remember this day again for a very, very long time. July 2nd, 2018, <laughs> I talked to Kyle Bukoskis on the phone while in Thunder Bay under the Fit for Less sign because I was working out at Fit for Less there. And I was just on the phone with him for an hour and a half. And I remember getting my workout shoes all dirty because I stepped in mud and all that stuff. But he spent 90 minutes talking to me, Robin and Brent. 90 minutes, a yeah. national broadcaster. So giving with this time to a student at the time doing his practicum. And he gave me 90 minutes of his backstory of life tips. And one of the things he said to me is never say no to an opportunity. If you don't feel like you have time, make time. You always make time for the things that are important. Sorry, Robin, go ahead. No, it's fun, Tony. It's that's it's, it's terrific. But Ed Brin can tell you that I'm slow on the uptake sometimes. I, I'm hearing all these exact times and dates and the first couple of references went right over my head. What's the deal with you having a mental note or a written <laughs> note about exactly times and dates and actually time of the day in some cases <laughs> when these things happen? Where did that come from? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not sure. It's like, it's like when you have like your Chrome browser open and you bookmark something, that's just kind of how I operate in life. I just bookmark something. I'm like, Hey, this could be important. Bang. I'll keep it in the memory bank. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, you guys might be impressed with my dates right now, but I, I have a terrible memory at times. And uh, I guess it's just a really, really, really important things that I've been able to. I was so. just going to point out, I, I'll put this down as youth. Because as you get older, if you don't have it in your Chromebook or on your calendar, your iCal or whatever it is, you're going to forget by the time you get to our age. Hey, uh, we're not going to get specific on a lot of stuff here, but uh, so far, uh, what do you think? This has been a fascinating Oilers season. Uh, I hate to say it, but I do like to watch the guys scrambling a little bit. I watched the post-game coverage the other night, and and, uh, Connor was there. Connor looks quite down about things, very concerned about things. But you know what? I like seeing that. I like because I think that you learn, we can learn through winning and it's nice and it's great. But I think that we learn more about ourselves when the times are tough than when they're great. And I think that this little uh, thing that they're going through right now, whenever they come out of it, I think they're going to be better for it. And I think that uh, they just got to try to tune out all the extra noise from the fans and the media and just focus a little bit and and they'll kind of get it together but uh, are you are you sensing the same sort of thing? Yeah, I, I definitely feel the same way. Just going back to uh, my previous answer, I feel like resistance will be a good thing 
yeah. in the big picture for this team. You learn a lot about somebody. You learn a lot about a man's character and a woman's character when their back is against the ropes. And right now the Oilers have their back against the ropes. They've lost five straight. Thankfully, a good start for the team. Gives them a little bit of leeway, a little bit of time to figure things out because that's what a good start gets you. A really good start in the National Hockey League will give you an okay time to have this. Time, yep. And that's what they're going through right now. And I feel like you learn a lot about people. You learn a lot about people in the face of adversity. You look at a guy like Muhammad Ali. He was the best when his back was against the ropes because that is how strong of a character he is. Can the Oilers bounce back out of a time like this and not only get back to winning hockey, but be a better team for it? Those are two different things. Those are two different things in my opinion. Winning is one thing, but learning and actually becoming more of a team is another. That will be the true symbol of how far this team can come. One of the the uh, things that I see impacting uh, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, and it's it goes without saying, it's so rare to have two players of this caliber at the same time, right? And yeah, they're... Yeah. they're prime years um and this applies to hall and and tippet as well um the fact that edmonton hasn't had success hasn't won a cup since 90 yeah uh, and hasn't been to the cup since 06 it's not their fault yeah but it's their problem yep because they're in the driver's seat now and fans are going hey come on pretty good support here pretty passionate yeah. fans here give yeah. us something to work with we're now into year six seven eight whatever it is with connor and with leon uh it's about time we're kind of prime time now uh when are you yeah. going to deliver do you understand that uh that uh, sentiment from the fan base 100 percent, 100 percent, especially given the if People want to coin it the decade of darkness that they had to endure. And fans still came to every game. They still packed Rexall place and the yeah. early stages of Rogers place. So hundred percent, this team is so heavily supported by their fan base. And sometimes, yeah, some negative emotions do come out and that's completely fair because this fan base has had to endure a lot, especially over the last, uh, I guess it would be 31 years since they've last won a cup. They've go gone through a lot. So yes, the patience is wearing thin here, but for me, if I'm the or this, if I'm head coach Dave Tippett, or if I'm any other guy in that locker room, I'm, I'll be honest, I wouldn't worry about that. I would not worry. I worry about how, what can I do today to become better tomorrow and to get closer to the Stanley Cup tomorrow. Now, that being said, you still understand where the fans are coming from. You completely get it, but you don't worry about it. You got work to do. Uh, thanks for your time today. It's funny, we were talking about getting you on back in September, just before training camp, and now here yeah. we are just before the new year. Uh, can we promise to get you back on uh, before the playoffs? Is that going to be okay? I know it's going to be a zany time for you. You know what? 100%, and you can blame me for all of that. <laughs> September, I was just coming off of... 10 Indian weddings. Robin Britton, have you guys ever been to an Indian wedding? I've been to one. I get it. Okay. Okay. So there's, like you know 70, we... there's like 70 days of celebration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's every Indian wedding goes from, typically it goes from Tuesday till Sunday night. Okay. I went through 10 of those from June 22nd until September 8th. <laughs> again was, with the dates. I was, I was in, again with the dates, right? <laughs> but I was in full recovery mode and I'll be honest with you guys. I'm like, I kind of have to put my energy here first. So I had yeah. to decline back in September. And then it was just an unusually busy time here with Oilers TV in October, November, because we were helping out a ton with game presentation and our, our feet were just in so many different waters because we finally had fans back in the building, which we were so excited for but also made for a busy time. So chalk that one up to me. That's okay. I apologize, but I thank you guys for having me, and I can't wait to be back before the playoffs. Our good friend Craig Simpson, you mentioned Kyle Bukowskis. You bring good TV hair to our uh, – to our. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but you've got it right now, so, uh, so flaunt it is the way I word it. Hey, thanks well, well, for your time. Thank you. This has been unbelievable. Yeah, uh, it's great to catch up with you. 
guys, it was a pleasure getting to know you guys. I can't wait to have you guys uh, back in, in my presence soon. And uh, take care. Happy Monday and crush the week. The Outsiders is brought to you by the Macintosh Group at Remax River City. So here we are. We're inching a little bit closer to Christmas. And you would think that in the Metro Edmonton market, things would be slowing down a little bit on the real estate front. But it's surprisingly very steady right now, which is great. Brent McIntosh is just back from his European junket where he was representing Canada, along with other REMAX agents from across Canada. They were over in Europe having some fun, but Brent's back now, and he's quite pleased with the way things are moving along. In fact, he just sold a home for a really good friend of mine, Chris, just recently. It took about 30 days to to uh, sell, and then Chris went on and bought another home in the in the market. So there is definitely something going on, and it is a positive. But if you are looking to sell your current home and maybe buy something new, then make sure you give them a call at 780-464-0075, or you can check them out online at macintoshgroup.ca. They'll start you off with a complimentary evaluation of your current home. There's no obligation at all, and certainly no deadline for this offer, but don't let the market pass you by. So both buyers and sellers are more than welcome to call the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City. You can do it directly. Once again, the phone number, 780 464-0075 464-0075 or you can find them at macintoshgroup.ca and tell them the outsider sent you so there you go tony Breyer. thank you for being with us on the uh, on the podcast today lots to talk about robin first things first mm-hmm. before we talk hockey let's talk about the uh, the gray cup game it was a 33 25 victory for the bombers over the tiger cats in overtime now, I'd heard the word classic being thrown out numerous times during the broadcast yesterday, and I went, uh, no, wasn't a classic at all. In fact, I'd flipped over to watch Tampa Bay taking on uh, Buffalo frequently during the first half because I thought the the start of the Grey Cup game was pretty boring. But mm-hmm. as is always the case with the Grey Cup, it picks up big-time speed at the start of the third and carries into the fourth quarter, which always seems to be a nail-biter. But it doesn't make it a classic. It made it a great finish. But it was still kind of fun to watch. And the Tiger Cats gave Winnipeg all they could handle. But once again, the Bombers just a little too much. Well, it's funny. And I'm glad glad I didn't do it in in, uh, hindsight. Uh, At the end of the first half, I was just going to do the one word tweet. And that one word was going to be yawner. Uh, it, it, uh, it finished far from that, um, uh, with all the drama and maybe a little extra you'd expect. And I tell you what, if that wasn't a circus interception to end the game, I don't know what it was because three different players touched that ball before it ended. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought, uh, Winnipeg was a far better team going in. I still do. Uh, again, you know, Zach Kolaris had some troubles. He, 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 you can't expect him to be perfect, but, you know, he threw a couple of picks. But you know what? It was a good game and, and uh, in the back end, and that's good for the fans in Hamilton. You, f- you kind of feel for them because they are – Uh, such good fans. They support that ball club. They've gone a long time without anything to really cheer about in terms of a championship. Um, And they were close again. So uh, it was overall, it it was a terrific game. I thought also anytime your owner is referred to as caretaker, I kind of like that. I think that that's kind of neat. Hey, the the best two great cups I've ever seen, and I've been around for a, a bit, and I've covered thirteen of them. And of course, the two that I that stand out for me, I was at both. Eighty nine, it was Saskatchewan and Hamilton. Great game. Went right down to the wire. Dave Ridgeway with a field goal to win it for Saskatchewan. They hadn't won yeah. in well, they hadn't won. And the other one was two thousand and five. The Edmonton Eskimos beating the Montreal Alouettes in overtime that was crazy where coaches didn't know what freaking down it was and are prancing out onto the field. Ricky Ray and Anthony Calvillo toe-to-toe. It was a, it was a heavyweight bout. But, but both of those games started slow. And so when you start taking a look at what is a classic Grey Cup game, they all, they all have one common thread for me, and that is the first half is okay, but the second half is dynamite, and that's exactly what... The one yesterday turned out to be, and I hate to say this too, because I'm not in the demographic anymore, although I might 
be in in the eyes of some people. Uh, but I actually enjoyed the halftime show. I love it when I watch a band that I, I don't really know much about uh, look like they're working hard to entertain and they and their enthusiasm level. And then listening to the the lead guy on the broadcast for a couple of minutes who was more interested in the game than he was talking about his band. I just thought it was uh, I thought it was a good success for the Canadian Football League in a season that really was weird. It was just a weird year. Yeah, you know, uh, for me, we're in the classic game is uh, 1964. I was just a young reporter then. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Uh, I am glad that it turned out the way it did. You know, we've talked over the last year when there was no season and when they finally got this season off the ground, there are challenges uh, for this league from the top down. Uh, there are things that need to be done uh, better uh, at, at all levels. Uh, you know, there's been issues here in Edmonton. A uh, few. But I'll tell you what, I, I, I was, am, and will remain if I can say it now that we're out of the sort of the MSM stream uh, as day-to-day guys, I'm a fan of this league and I want to see it succeed. And days when you have a crazy end in a championship game like yesterday, where there's some back and forth, I think it's good for the league. It's good to see the fans with their colors on back in the seats. Uh, It's good to uh, have some drama and, you know, I hope, the issues that face the league uh, right across the country, uh, people work away at, at solving those. There is some legitimate questions about adding to the fan base and not having it be as you referred to the uh, you and I. Yeah, uh, it needs to expand beyond that. And I don't know how you do it. I don't think it can be all sizzle without some steak. I think it's got to, you know, it's got to be a course you plot carefully needs to be done. But for one day, uh, I really enjoyed the Canadian football league product yesterday. I think the big thing for the league is to do one thing, listen and be very observant as well here in Edmonton. It couldn't have been more, more, uh, More obvious. We had two soccer games where we had a very diverse crowd, all ages, Mm -hmm. uh, all different, uh, different people from different walks of life. I mean, it was, it was pretty fantastic. So they had two games and they drew just under or just slightly over a hundred thousand while the Elks have had trouble drawing, you know, flies in a lot of ways. But then again, a lot of that's also self-induced. However, uh, there's something to be drawn from that. I guess it's up to the organization. It's also up to the league to start to look at situations like that and say, how can we be better? Rather than just think that everything is great. Numerous times when the previous football club here in Edmonton would draw thirty five to 40,000 and they would be happy with that. And you should be happy with that. But I always looked at the 20,000 empty seats and thought to myself, how can we be better? How can, how can these guys be better to fill those 20,000 empty seats? They didn't care. Well, the problem is now that, that, that you know, generation has kind of gone away, and now they've got to work really hard to get it back. So we'll see how they, how they are able to, to kind of deal with things. And you and I have talked about this, Brennan. Maybe I'm wrong, and I hope I am, because I'd love to be uh, lowballing it a bit, because the more the more – people in the seats the better but i think the days of uh needing 50 or fifty five thousand seats are over for everybody i agree uh, even if you do a really good job there are just so many other uh distractions and pastimes out there and you can't make fun of them anymore some people you know people are there are leagues for them now where people are playing sports on video games and it's legit. It's drawing people. There are things you and I never dreamed of as teenagers or even 30 or 40 year olds that are out there now. So you don't just have that built in audience, even if you don't have an NHL team in your town or this pro team or that pro team, you've got everything on. You've got all the channels, you've got all the games, you've got all the social media. So I think if, I think if this, the, CFL can build a model where they where, where you can consistently draw that at that 35,000 uh, 35,000 people mark. I think that's a success in most markets. 
if you structure the money the right way. I'm also going to bring up one thing here in in Edmonton that's got to change, and that is the restrictive radio rights agreement that they have with Chorus Radio. Uh, From numerous experiences that I've had down south in the NFL, on game day, outside the stadium, every radio station and television station is there because it's the place to be. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean they have any level of exclusivity inside the stadium, and they certainly are not allowed to do anything while the game is on because that's where the rights holder exercises their rights. But the problem here for the longest time, and and I should know because Marty Forbes and myself, we're the ones who launched 1260, which was then Team 1260, which is now TSN 1260. We were told we were not allowed or even welcome to come and talk about the Eskimo game outside the stadium because we were being pushed away by the radio rights holders. That is a horrible, horrible decision. It was a horrible decision by the football club then, and it's got to change now. you got to have every radio station on board talking about your game coming up like it's the place to be. And they're going to have to take a look at that agreement because that agreement is killing them, absolutely killing them. If they're not, if they're not, if somebody's not hearing on radio or anywhere else where they're getting any kind of feed, that this is the place to be, guess what? It isn't. All of a sudden, going out for a night of axe throwing is just as important as going to watch the football club at Commonwealth Stadium. That would be the first place I would look. They've got to work with the rights holder and allow other radio stations to come outside the stadium and do a media row, make it look like it's the happening place to be. And then, of course, they've got to work on what's going on on the field as well. So, I don't know. They've got some time to worry about it. Hey, let's touch on a few other quick things here. The Edmonton Oilers have gone into this horrible slump. Hey, listen, every team deals with a slump. I'm going to tell you one thing, and then you tell me if you agree. The coach is not going anywhere. The general manager is not going anywhere. The The first step that's going to happen to bust out of a slump, if the team can't do it, there's going to be a trade. So all these people looking to see the coach or the GM go, don't hold your breath. That's all I'm saying. Been around long enough to see it, and things have not changed enough to make me veer off of that thinking. No, and uh, you know we touched on this when we were talking with with, with Tony Bren. Um, fans here are passionate, and great. You know, Dave Tippett and Ken Holland uh, didn't lose their uh, minds in in the course of. You know, a, a month. This team was nine zero and one. They weren't. That didn't make them Stanley Cup contenders. No. Um, no. They, you know, they look better than they are uh, in that stretch. In these last five games, they w- looked much worse than they are. Um, that doesn't mean fire everybody, trade everybody. If you do that, it's it's not happening in. The- not with this, not with Holland and not with Tippett. Now, Holland's got more rope. GMs always do because generally he gets his, he gets to make a move. Five uh, years generally for GM, right? Yeah. And, and the trades always come first, Brent. History shows us that. Um, unless there's something behind the scenes where there's friction, the coach and the GM aren't on the same page. Uh, and all of a sudden they the, the cue and fire the coach first. That's not the case here. No, these men respect each other. They know each other. They have a history. Dave Tippett is a good hockey coach. I'm, I don't, I didn't need the nine Oh and one start to be convinced of it. And the losing skid right now hasn't changed my mind. If he goes and it could happen because it's a results business, it will only happen after this team misses the playoffs this year. And I don't see this team missing the playoffs. Let me ask. Let me ask you this question because it's been asked of me: Are they a, are they a playoff team? For me, the answer is real simple. Yes, they are. Yeah. Are they a contender? It's really simple for me. No, they're not. And that's where I see the Edmonton Oilers right now. Your thoughts um, on that? Well, quickly, uh, your definition of contender. Uh, I need to see uh, strength in every de- every position where I can count on it. I can't count on the Edmonton Oilers goaltending. As much as Koskinen's been okay at times, it's also been horrible at times. Skinner is developing. Love it. And Mike Smith's injury situation, which is about as mysterious as it comes for a lot of people, 
I'm not really sure on. So goaltending is a question mark. Then let's do a comparable to down south in Calgary. I think that uh, Markstrom is very solid. So I think they they obviously, they check the, the one box I can't check in Edmonton. Then the defense core, it's depleted here. I don't think it right now because of injury. I, I don't, my jury's a little bit out on the Oilers' defense. Mm-hmm. Calgary's defense is really, they, they're just a, they're a lunch bucket group and they just kind of get it done. Uh, so I think they kind of check the box right now, although they're looking a little tired lately. But then up front on the forward line, You've got great top six players on the Edmonton Oilers. Almost makes me want to check the forwards. But we've been saying now for three years, the bottom six guys aren't doing it. They're not helping yeah. the top six guys by contributing. It's been a failure here over the past two to three weeks. I see changes coming there. And even with both Connor and Leon and a good supporting group in the top six, I don't know if that's going to be enough to see them do anything in the playoffs other than what they've done the last few seasons in the playoffs, and that's being disappoint. Okay. Um, my definition of contender is far more liberal uh, than yours. Okay. Uh, which doesn't make it right. It just makes it different. It makes it your opinion, look, yes. Yeah, I look back at 06. That was, let's not forget, that's an eighth-place hockey club. Or was it seventh by a point? Uh, they just barely got They were eighth, by the way. They were the number eight yeah. seed. Okay. My definition is this, Bryn, recognizing everything you've said is is uh, true, where, the, where your concerns are positionally. Mine is broad and it's generous. Can this team at its best, at its best, win a cup? Can this team, if things go their way, if the cards fall the right way, win a cup? My answer, again, is yes. There are teams, even at their best, aren't good enough to win a cup. Uh, They just don't have that level of talent. There are teams, even if they got all the breaks, that are not good enough. So I'm putting the Oilers in that, I guess, that stratosphere where I believe the contenders are i think at the end of the year they are in that top eight group of clubs to me that makes them a legitimate contender uh now that there's that's not a firm number but roughly speaking to me that there's a top tier of eight teams that have a a real chance without getting every break because there's the other part of that yeah well, I said it was part of my definition. Seldom do you get every break. Seldom does everything go your way. And seldom are you always at your best. So there's a little wiggle room in there. I think they're a top eight team. I think they're a contender. That's allowing for the flaws that you've pointed out. Well, I don't think Kevin Lowe ever really truly got enough credit for piecing together that team the year before they went to the, the Stanley Cup final. He, he put some nice pieces into place, in particular at the trade deadline. He never gets credit for that. But the, the, the biggest issue for me, when I take a look at, the, at, at the, the broad picture, is that my I guess my confidence level in their goaltending is just not good right now. And the one thing, I still remember a good friend of mine, Scott Taylor, longtime writer and broadcaster mm-hmm. in Winnipeg, who said, do you know why they call it the Stanley Cup playoffs? Mm-hmm. And I said, sure. He says, No, really, do you know why they call it the Stanley Cup playoffs? And I said, okay, why? He says, because you can't call it goaltending. And (laughs) and you know what? He's not wrong. If you're goaltending, you're goaltending, and Craig McTavish even told me in 2006, your goaltending can cover up a lot of deficiencies. Yep. So the question for me, I guess, when I take a look at the things, zero in on it, is if the goaltending can get its shit together here, maybe they can because they did get off to a great start because of great goaltending and a power play that obviously teams have now figured out how to handle. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned with Tony, talking to an NHL scout who's a friend of mine from one of the Eastern Division teams, and I always listen to those guys more about the West teams and mm-hmm. the Western uh, scouts about the Eastern teams because they have absolutely, they don't care, right? They, they've got a little more of a, a level of objectivity about it, I feel. Anyway, said, And he told me this three weeks ago. He said, you watch what's going to happen in the next little while with the Oilers' power play. Teams are going to forget about the guys on the point. 
what yeah. they're going to do is they're going to basically just collapse down low. And because there's going to be so much traffic down low, that cross ice pass, the, the, the legendary pass from Connor McDavid to Leon Drysaddle, instead of it being there 70% of the time, will only be there 30 to 20% of the time. And he was mm-hmm. right. We're seeing it. And the other thing is that teams aren't really concerned that, or even it isn't even bothering them that the Oilers will take a shot, uh, shot from the point. But the thing is that they don't think anybody's going to take it to the net, so they're trying to keep them to the outside, and they've done it. And all of a sudden, the power play doesn't look as powerful. Still good, but they haven't. They've only got like one goal in twenty-three attempts lately going in here. So obviously, something has happened there. And special teams don't win you. They don't win you very much in the playoffs because you're not going to get those power play chances. We saw mm-hmm. that last year. You're going to keep seeing it there. Doesn't matter how much Connor McDavid does. It's not going to make any difference. So it's going to boil down. To, it's going to boil down to five on five. Going to boil down to goaltending, and that's a big concern for me on the Edmonton Oilers. I'll say this, Bryn. Okay. Um, and 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 uh, the first word would be agreed. But I'm not going to. Uh, like I say, I, I wasn't getting carried away after nine zero and one. I'm not going to get carried away after five straight losses. Me neither. The other. The other, other teams, the opposition, when they do their film work, film work, video, yes. <laughs> uh, they've made adjustments. Now, I expect the Oilers to adjust. I completely agree. Adjust the adjustments. Here's the other thing. Last time I checked, you need 16 wins to win a Stanley Cup. Correct. I think Mike Smith and Miko Koskinen are capable of – Putting together, and that's given that they were out goaltended by Connor Hellebuck. I uh, just a little bit. I thought Mike Smith was pretty good in the playoffs last year. To me, Mike Smith has shown, and it's not the best time to say Mike Smith has shown when he's still trying to get the, the ankle issue, the ankle high ankle sprain figured out, and that's what it is. Um, but he's capable of. Him and Koskinen are capable of those 16 wins, not on their own. We have to address those other things, but making adjustments on the power play, getting, shaking some life out of the bottom six group of forwards, but goaltending that key spot that you mentioned, Mike Smith, when he's on, it's scary how good he is for a player his age. And he doesn't need to do it for a half a season. He needs to do it for 16 wins. I think they get it. I think they have a shot, but first they have to get there and they have to adjust to what other teams have adjusted to with them, power play. They have to get that bottom six going. And, and you know what, Brent? Until you do it, fans say, don't tell me, show me. And I understand that. But this group is better on the on the proverbial on paper than the group last year. But they need to get something done. And if they don't, there is time to tweak it. It's not a big trade that changes your top, your bottom six, because yeah. they wouldn't be a bottom six player if they were a big trade. But it's got to be the right guy or the right tweak or the right shift shift of players from one position to another. That's what the rest of the season is for. You go up to the deadline, you go, we've tried it. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Here's what we do. No. Okay. What road do we go down now? There's time. Um, I want to see more than the hot start and the recent fold before I declare this team anything uh, without uh, having more time to take a look. Dave Tippett is the expert. I'm not, but this is my opinion. Two things I want to see from Dave Tippett here in the next little while. I, I'm getting tired of watching the third line start a game. I'd yes. like to. I'd like to start seeing the number one. I. You can even load Connor and uh, and Leon on the first line for the first shift, and keep the opposition back on their heels a little bit. But the mm. constant playing of the third line to start the games is not working in my estimation. And then the other thing that I don't want to see Tip do is I do not want to see anybody from the bottom two lines moving up to the top line. Because what the thing that really has always bothered me about bottom six players is when they get a taste of the caviar up on that front line, all of a sudden yeah. they forget what got them there. And it, a classic example, ah, I like Zach Cassian. Good guy. I mean, look at everything he's gone through. But you know what? He's successful when he crashes and bangs, takes the puck to the net, causes shit in front of the front of the net. 
Yeah. And ever since he has had that experiment where he's up on the top line, it's like he figures all of a sudden he's a top line guy. He isn't. He's a line three or a line four guy. And that's a disease that not just Zach Cassian's got. Other players who play on lines three and four can never forget what got them there and is keeping them there. And it isn't scoring goals. It's uh, it's doing all those other little things right. So we're out of time, man. We're running along. I love this has been a fun show today, though. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and there's more time to talk about some of the things we've touched on here. But uh, I'll just say to keep it brief, I agree on Cassie and uh, shit or get off the pot, Zach, because you've been given the contract. Uh, you need to earn that contract now. It doesn't end, to borrow from Mac T, it doesn't end when you get the big contract. It starts. It's supposed to start there. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. Yeah. Well, let's see that moving forward, shall we? And that's all I got. Make sure you check us out on Twitter. The handle's really simple. It is at Outsiders2020. Please, will you do us a favor? If you're following us on Twitter, send us some feedback. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. That's what it's all about. If you agree with us or disagree with us, make sure you send us a thought or two on that. Also, tell your friends to subscribe to our RSS feed on any of your favorite ear candy sites like Apple, Google, Spotify, Pocket Cast. Still, the number one people what the number one way people are getting hold of us is via or not getting hold of us, but tuning us in is on Apple, followed quickly by Spotify. However, that's where we are. We're also on YouTube. Robin records from his luxurious studio. At, is there a nickname for your studio or a studio name, or are you just calling it Robin's Place in the Southwest there? No, no, it's uh, it's it's Bronte Studios of Cameron Heights. Thank you. Okay, I'll make a note of that so I can plug it properly next week. And I'm recording at the Road 55 studio in downtown Edmonton. We're like a block from Roger's Place. That's it. Robin, thanks for your time, as always. This is a this has been a lot of fun. Thanks to Tony Breyer for coming on, and uh, I guess we'll see you next week, huh? You sure will. Bye-bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. <laughs>